So I'm talking about macro update, what's going on with MIPS, the Merit-Based Incentive Payment System. And this is my very favorite picture because the doctor is so uh, just looking at the patient, trying to figure out what to do, and the mother and father are there grieving, the family's there, and it's, it really, to me, captures the epitome of the patient-physician relationship, and you'll notice that they're in the patient's home. And who, where are we now, and who do we serve? Here's our little army of uh, budding doctors doing what we should do, entering data at the computer, and I don't see a patient in sight, and the only person missing here is the scribe, unless that's the, the cute blonde with the bun at the bottom. So this all boils back to this promise, um, and, and uh, everyone has referred to this in 1965, and I, I think this bears reading, nothing in this title shall be construed to authorize any federal officer employee to exercise any supervision or control over the practice of medicine, or the manner in which medical services are provided, or over the selection, tenure, or compensation of any officer or employee or any institution, agency, or person providing health care services. Okay. Government has flagrantly violated their prohibition clause with a series of crescendoing, destructive laws that have set really, you know, Dr. Christman's right on the money. And uh, so, <laughs> Twyla's the expert on HIPAA, and I tend to be a reader of the laws because I really want to see what's in them. So I've read MACRA and the rules, et cetera. Two new ones, the 21st Century Cures Act and the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2018 also contain some goodies. Uh, what's next? Medicare for All, HR 876, and it already has 123 co-sponsors. And Marilyn Singleton's read that and several of us. It's short, it's really more of a campaign thing. But if the House flips and the Senate, we may be headed for Medicare for All in short time. So we have to ask ourselves, are we the generation of physicians acquiescing to the commandeering of our profession? Who do we serve, the patient or the state? And MACRA, MIPS, and the composite performance score, score are tools of the state. Now, any slides in blue, I'm not plagiarizing. Um, those belong to the government. Um, I, you go online, and one of the things I've had to do to prepare this talk is read all the public transcripts, all the commentary, and at times it's boring, at times it's very interesting because you can pick up a few things. So all these blue slides are facts. I didn't make them up. So we know about Part A and Part B. Part A, the hospital insurance you're required to do or you give up your Social Security, that's 40%, 42%. And it's financed by the payroll taxes. It is insolvent in 2026. That's eight years. Then Part B physician, hospital outpatient departments, and Part D, the prescription drug coverage, is in the other part of that. That's financed by general tax revenues and premiums, and the premiums are going up for people. This is solvent only because they keep increasing the taxes and the premiums. Then, let's look at the scope of how much money this is for just Medicare. In 2016, inpatient was 116 billion, outpatient was 61 billion. Uncompensated care, um, compensated care was 6.4 billion. So these are numbers, and I've, Jeremy has copies of this. It's also public, um, public record, you can look it up. This is from MedPAC. But this, this will be available if anybody's interested in looking, looking at this in more depth. But what's important about these slides is a glance, and this is a very visual talk, I'm an ophthalmologist, makes sense. But um, if we look at this in short order, by 2041, spending on Medicare and the other health programs, Social Security and the net interest will exceed total federal revenues. Now look at this. Everybody knows this. But on the, uh, the blue line shows that um, the enrollment in Medicare Part A has skyrocketed. And unfortunately, if you look at the workers paying in per Part A beneficiary, they have, they're less than half. This is not a winning formula. Now, if you look at the number of clinicians, and remember words matter, clinicians, they, MedPAC looks at the supply. Is Medicare meeting its need? And they say, well, you know, we have about the same number of clinicians. We look down at the bottom, that green is the primary care, they're about the same. Other physicians, you know, they're kind of about the same. Um, but what you do know, what is clear, is the pink is going higher and that's the nurse practitioners and the PAs. So while primary care is about the same, specialists are down, and 
non-doctors are way up. This is something called marginal profit. And if you look at when, when people would take uh, Medicare patients in 2013, there was a 14% marginal, marginal profit. Now it's down to eight and going down. Look at the payment updates. The bottom yellow line is Medicare payment updates since 2000. Look at the red line, spending per beneficiary. So volume's going up on what each beneficiary is doing, and doctors are working harder, but they're not making any more money. Medicare costs, now this is very interesting to me. They are a burden for beneficiaries now. So when people come to you and say, oh, you can't take away my Medicare. In 2018, just parts B and D, cost sharing, will consume 24% of the average Social Security benefit. In 1980, this was 7%. In 2035, 30% of people's Social Security benefit will be going to pay Part B and D. On average, Social Security benefits account for more than 60% of seniors' incomes. But look at this. For 20% of seniors, their Social Security is 100% of their income. So in short order, I mean, right now, 25% of their income is going to health care, whether they use it or not. And this is what's interesting, too. The um, health care spending for premiums outpaced the household income over the last 10 years by a substantial amount. It used to be that that was about 24% of the household income for, for a family, if you look at what the premiums are. Now it's a third. That's quite shocking. The yellow line is Medicare per capita growth. And look at the blue and pink. Employer-sponsored HMO plans and employer-sponsored PPO premium growth has grown twice as fast as Medicare costs. And this, these insurance companies are just uh, raking it in no matter what they say. And boy, um, by 2022, and folks, we're almost there, uh, Medicare spending is about to hit a trillion dollars. So we have a problem. Um, physician services. About 70 billion in 2016. This is 15% of fee-for-service spending. Now remember, when they talk about these 952,000, let's round it off, a million clinicians that bill Medicare, remember that five, it's really not even 600,000 that are physicians. Majority, or a significant, maybe a third, are advanced practice nurses, PAs, and even therapists and other providers. So what did, Medi what did uh, MACRA do? Well, you know, the SGR was failing, and SGR was created the same year that MedPAC was. MedPAC was put into SGR to monitor them, not that they pay any attention to them. But MACRA said, well, SGR is horrible, we'd lose 21%, so we're going to give you all a 0.5% increase for 2016 to 2019, but then it's zero going forward for the rest of time. But in order, otherwise, you're going to get, maybe get a little benefit, 5% incentive, and everyone said, wow, this is great. How did this happen, and how can we stop it? Well, what I've discovered is that stakeholders influence Congress to pass a law using power, money, and messaging, and they create a perceived need if they need to, and then Congress passes the law. Then the executive branch, via CMS, has to write the rules of enforcement. And the proposed rule is released for the public comment, and stakeholders act again. If they don't, it just goes past as they want it to. The final rule is published, and the law goes into effect. And then they repeat this process, because the rules that they write to restrict anything to happen, if they need to change it, they just write a new law. And then they do new rules and change the intent and the effect of the original law. They increase expense, special interests, third parties, unintended consequences occur, and government control increases why the taxpayers and we the pe we people lose. And I really grieve over MACRA, um, the Medicare Access and Chip Reauthorization Act. It is truly what I believe is a Trojan horse, the, the implementation of the government takeover of medicine. And so I've written on it, and, and thank goodness for APS because they're the one journal that will uh, take my commentary and help me convey it. Again, a blue slide. I don't make this up. And here are the four categories. So government says physicians will be graded on four performance categories, and they establish them. We're familiar with them. They've changed the name to make them sound more appealing and or well informed. But they're quality, advancing care information, practice improvement activities, and cost. And then they have very convoluted formulas. I love the formula here, the example of calculating a final score, that's an example of CMS, and, and you can see that formula there. 
And so I always post this stuff because people say I make it up, and I don't. I don't write it. I just read it, and then I take a picture of it. Um, to me, macro is very reminiscent of what China's doing now to their population to control them. They're creating a grading system on their Communist Party members in multiple, I think they have over 160 performance categories. Um, and to me, it's a combination of bribery, coercion, and public shaming. And government states throughout these rules and the laws, and when you read the transcripts of people discussing what they, when they're discussing intent, they are discussing driving physician behavior. It's social engineering. And MIPS is using big data to score patients and to score people because they will have the data to control our behavior and ultimately what happens to us and what care we get. And the score that we get as physicians from zero to 100, the composite performance score that is posted on the public CMS Physician Compare website, to me, is nothing beyond public shaming, humiliation, and demoralization. And they post it for all to see. One of the things, and this is just a slight summary of what I fear and that what I picked up in the rule, is that they granted themselves the ability to see everyone's personal protected health information. And that's in the records, and if you go online and you do data collection, there are certification bodies that have access to your records. And from the rules, it says, this is not just Medicare patients. If you don't have enough Medicare patients, they say, okay, well then, great. In order to get your bonus, you can submit data on all your patients. So now they want all payer data, and they're developing this model as we speak. They will keep the data for, at least, if you're going to be at one of the certified bodies, you have to keep the data for 10 years. Day before year 10 is over, if they want your stuff, you have to keep it for eternity. Cost. This is the one that really scares me. They say, oh, we're not going to look at cost. We want to make this easy for y'all. And so when I read the law, I posed the question to them. Um, what if you decide and you're going to change the cost to 100%? They said, well, we won't do that. Um, well, let's look at the chart they posted in the rule. The doctors that spend the most on their patients at the top get one to two points. At the bottom, the doctors that spend the least on their patients get 10 points. So what does that tell you? Okay, I don't make this up. Doctors are penalized for delivering care. So the macro is a Trojan horse. It's all patients, all insurers, not just MIPS data, it's all data. It's a total violation of privacy and the Hippocratic Oath. So is macro worse than the SGR? Absolutely. Look what happens in 10 years no matter which path you take. Let's look if you decide to opt out and pay the penalty at the top. You're down 26%. If you have an average, oh, and you get an F on your public score. Um, if you, let's say you're exempted and you have an average score, you're still down 18%, you get a C. If you get a perfect score, you get a B, you're still down. Now the people at the bottom that get a perfect MIPS and advanced payment care model, you're up 7.5%. But look at the disparity, that's like 33 or 34%. But you get an A. And this was the infamous table 64 that, that told their plan. I mean, you can look at the table right here and this is for everyone to see. What it shows you is that 87% of solo doctors will lose. 70% of doctors in a practice of two to nine will be penalized. On the other hand, in the big giant pack practices with over 100 people, remember it's clinicians. They get everybody in there. And if you have over 100 people, you have an 81.3% chance of getting a positive payment adjustment and only an 18% of having a negative. So small practices will be shuffled into MIPS and stand to lose. And even this guy, Farzad Motashari, that I listened to, um, says, for a solo small practice, it's financial suicide. What does that tell you? The underlying threat is consolidation. They want us to all be employed. Here's another um, MD from the advisory board company. 67% of high Medicare volume physicians view MACRA as a reason to give up their independence. MACRA has more potential to drive consolidation than even the Affordable Care Act. So this is when I went to CMS and I had the ability, I did like, the only time I've ever really had some respect and I appreciate the opportunity for Andy Slavitt having me up to address these issues because in Texas, via the TMA and via the AMA, 
over 60% of our practices are one to three people. Under MIPS, 87% of all these practices are going to lose. And if you have an economically diverse and vast state like Texas, what's going to happen to the patients? And it's that way across the United States. So what they did, they did acquiesce a little bit, and they increased exemptions. They increased that people could be exempt from it. And really that's what I, they need to do, is just let these big groups have MIPS or MAC or whatever they want. Let everybody else out. And then the other thing I asked them is who's going to pay for all these other third and fourth and fifth party people you're going to have? And they didn't know, and they didn't know how much it was going to cost. So MedPAC has made this easy for us. They say Med MIPS is not sustainable, it's a burden. Just in the first year, just them, they had to spend a billion dollars on it. They don't have, where do they get another billion dollars? They're already bankrupt. It's complex, it doesn't identify physicians, uh, low or high value. Um, they're gonna make the adjustments, it's going on now. And they said, we better fix this and we better get rid of it. it we talked about this, it costs $40,000 for physicians to get on the EMR. My associate is young, she got on it, it was costing her $80,000, but I said to the scribes, this, that, she got off, she's back to paper, happy as can be, I'm smiling. In just four specialties, uh, they spent $15.4 billion per, per, just reporting. That's on the physician side. Where are we going to get that? So if you take that 40000 times all the physicians, it's $17 billion that we don't have, plus the billion CMS spent to report nothing. So um, the federal government states they seek to drive our behavior, and why are they doing this? They want to end fee-for-service. This is from CMS. This is what CMS has to do, and this is online because it's so convoluted. They said you better pick MIX, MIPS or MACRA. It's an incentive program. Now, who has to do this? Physicians, which includes doctors of medicine, doctors of osteopathy, doctors of dental surgery. They got the dentists. Uh, podiatrists, optometrists, and chiropractors, PAs, NPs, nurse specialists, CRNAs, and any group that includes one of the professionals listed above. I wonder if that's my family. We have a lot of physicians. I guess we're all in it. Now, I saw this in the initial rule. Look at this little thing, nugget, stuck in there. We intend to consider using our authority under the Act to expand the definitions of MIPS eligible clinician to include additional eligible clinicians through rulemaking in future years. Wow, any potential for a problem there? Okay, so if you're not eligible for MIPS, you're not going to get a payment adjustment, but you better prepare, they'll let you volunteer. Now here's what happened. The 21st Century Cures Act, what was this? Oh, it sounds great, let's cure everything. But what they did was rename and reweight advancing care information, which is electronic record recording, to promoting interoperability. And then they reweighted the category. Look at this one, the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2018. It included several changes, and the one that really got me is what I said, well, what if you make cost 100%? They said, we can't. Well, they just passed this law. It allows for flexibility in the weight of the cost performance category. So what if they decide to make cost 100%? So here's the rule they did. They changed the people that can be exempt. They increased exemptions. They added more options for small practices. They created a virtual group. You can get with, together with other people, pull your data. Well, how meaningful is that? And they said gradual implementation. And what gets me is they always say they're decreasing regulatory burden when they can just get our data straight from our computers. And I love this, pick your pace. All you have to do is pick one thing to report this year, earn just 15 points, and you don't have a penalty. And here's how you can contact them if you have any questions. You know, CMS is right there. So not so fast. These nonsense measures are depending now on patient whims. Look at what they're proposing. Here's a measure. The average change in leg pain following lumbar discectomy or laminectomy, and that's from a patient reporting on a form. Here's what also happened. Whoops, we had calculation errors. We had to regrade, and everybody's grades were wrong, and so what we paid you is wrong. It's a big mess. So this year, over 418,000 Medicare providers had to participate. They weren't exempt. And all they had to do was do one quality measure, and I call this the pick your pace. They lure you in, and people are doing it. Why are we doing this? 
Now, what does Congress say? Remember, Congress passed the law. Well, I had to go see Mike Burgess. I am not proud of Mike Burgess. Um, he's my uh, physician congressman from Texas. He is very proud of MACRA. He sponsored it. He loves it. He got rid of SGR, and he's on Energy and Commerce, Subcommittee on Health, and he also was, here's a meeting they had in July. It's bipartisan oversight, and they're looking at the effects of what did this bipartisan budget, budget act do to it, and who all's there? You know, who's listening? Well, he got to bring in some witnesses, and here's a list of the witnesses, and they have this nice bipartisan committee. It kind of reminded me of the recent Senate committees we've had it, and I call it the Kavanaughing of MACRA. And uh, I listened to this, I watched it, and I read it, and I really, ugh. Um, Mike Burgess says that MACRA changed the world of Medicare provider payments as we knew it. And um, it did, it did. So who, where were we? Were all, was anybody here invited to be a witness? I wasn't. I didn't see any private physicians, nobody on the National Physicians Council, APS, DPC, no one was there. Uh, the immediate prep, past president of the AMA was. A director of quality and health policy of the American College of Surgeons was. A government relations uh, um, person from Ascaris, because we have a big data bank you can report in and they get paid for that. The head of the... Um, American Medical Group, a trade association leading the transformation of healthcare in America, and then a big board of the American physicians groups. So he got real big business, big group people to come. And um, the majority of practices were not represented. And the big idea here, the witnesses said, more clinicians need to be subject to MIPS. They cannot have the exemptions. And every single one of them said this. And they said, well, we realize they don't have the resources to do it, but..." We've been working on it, and we would be unfairly penalized if you don't make them get in and lose so we can make more money. That's the current argument. So 58% um, of physicians are not participating in MIPS, and it, Congress says we need to find a way to move to quality. It's far from perfect, but it's certainly an upgrade. The AMA said their only comment, and they're so um, patsy, they have no courage, it's really moved us away from an incentive system to a penalty-based program. Yes. Um, this guy, the American Medical Groups Association, said, uh, we've got to move towards population health rather than the sickness of patients. I love that one. There should be, it's just, it's beyond what you can imagine. So this is what's going up on Congress. Now, this one Congresswoman has been listening to her constituents, and she says, physicians spend two hours in front of a computer for every hour of direct patient care now. And the use of computers at home for as much as 20 hours a week contributing to physician burnout. That's, they did notice that. And here's uh, some residents I know. Here's my daughter for, at the end of her residency. They literally have to code and get prior auths and push a computer down the hall. The interns, my daughter that was an intern in internal medicine last year, um, she goes, oh, I'm still doing my notes. Why didn't you go on rounds? Well, the interns don't round anymore. We have to stay back and do the notes in our data. So need I say more? So this is Congressman Burgess's concluding comments. He asked the witnesses, do they believe MACRA is better than SGR? And the entire panel said yes. And then he said, should we work together to improve the current system or scrap it? They said, let's just improve it. And he didn't ask me, I would say scrap it. So um, now, the doctors caucus spoke, and they also think that we need to get more doctors to participate. And that's our physician congressmen that are doctors. So the final group I'm going to talk about is MedPAC. What has MedPAC said? And that's the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, nonpartisan, independent legislative branch. It was established when SGR was. They are supposed to tell the U.S. Congress, how is Medicare doing? There's 17 members. They meet publicly. Y'all can read this. Well, Congress didn't, doesn't listen to them. They didn't li listen to them on SGR, and they're not listening to them on this. And um, here's the thing. Some groups are having trouble with access, mainly the minority beneficiaries. They're waiting longer. We talked about the fact that there's decreased specialists and more non-physicians. And from the transcripts, I realized, this is quotes, this is pictures from the transcripts, 
they don't, when services are built incident to a physician's service, they could be performed by a PRNP but billed by the physician. We don't have any way to know who's providing the care. They cannot tell who's providing the care. And um, here's why they want more of us to report. Because a small number of clinicians, a small number, received very high payment adjustments, 77% in 2017. So they're seeing that we need to set limits, but nothing works. Everybody's gonna get this score. They're not comparable across clinicians. CMS is gonna move a lot of money based, around, uh, based on nonsense. And so because of how the program's designed, during the first year, everything's very compressed. And we know that 90% of people will either get no adjustment or a tiny adjustment. But in three years, very small differences in your MIP score will be blown up into potentially massive differences in who wins and who loses. So MedPAC says it's inequitable, it's burdensome, it will not improve care, nor will it move, Medicare pro uh, move the Medicare program and clinicians towards high value. If it was supposed to reward and penalize clinicians based on the value, it does not. We need to act now, we need to get rid of it. Because right now there's some flexibilities and they realize that the longer people stay in it, the more they're stuck. They're safe and invested. We've got to stay in. And there's a mentality that instead of like, we've run to the cliff, stop. They're like, we've spent so much, let's all jump and y'all get behind me. There is no sense of cut your losses in D.C. And when these penalties start hitting in a serious way, then there's going to be a call. So what is MedPAC's answer and recommendation? They said get rid of it get rid of it all, but they want a new voluntary value program. So they're literally debating a new program where they just, right now across the board, they want to do a complete withholding of everyone's Medicare. They've discussed anything from 2% to 10%. And these are just the blue things. These are their slides. You can read them yourself. They're like, it won't work. Um, and it's arbitrary. I mean, there's nothing good about it. It's not sustainable. But what I want you to see, the last thing I want to show you, um, is the voluntary value program they, is, that they're proposing is going to be based on three things. Clinical quality, value, and patient experience. They want to have uni uniform population-based measurements of clinical quality and patient experience and value. And the way they're going to find out, they're going to withhold the money and they want population-based, claims-calculated, patient-surveyed measures. So can you imagine this? Um, and so they'll just collect the data, come up with the numbers, and if you don't participate, you, don't, you lose your downward cap. You just give it up. So for me, MIPS makes it ethically untenable to work with third party, and they really can't do it with us. So are we gonna be an enabler? Are we entrapped or are we empowered? Are we empowered? We hold the sacred knowledge. We've been through the rite of passage. We need to stop giving it away. So are you the problem or the solution? So I'm really not ready to ride off into the sunset. I've thought about it a lot. And here I almost did. Um, because MIPS is squandering billions to grovel for hundreds. And to me, the CPS score is codified public shaming. So I have an action plan to serve the patient, not the state. We must discover laws that are in development, discover, read, and respond to federal and state laws. We need to call for the repeal of MIPS and entire, in the entirety of MACRA except for the SGR. We need to say absolutely not to their voluntary value program patient surveyed measures. Now, one way we can do if we want to be game players is pass new laws that set the value of all the performance categories at zero or eliminate the performance categories, eliminate the CPS. We need to strictly define the definition of physicians and non-physicians. We cannot fund the intermediate, in, in all these third parties and fourth parties, all these authorizing and auditing bodies. We need to have a massive opt-out of MIPS, Medicare, and Medicaid, and we need to guarantee and protect physicians' ability to legally practice medicine. Outside of this, we, we've got to put up, it, it's, it put up something. And I want to thank my colleagues here. I could not have 
opted out or done anything without the knowledge and wisdom and, and ability to do it, learning from people in AAPS. And I want to thank my staff. Here we celebrated on Monday before I came here our three-year anniversary of being third-party free, and this is me and my team. And these are amazing people, and they trusted me. I did take out a pretty large line of credit in case I failed. And I told them that ahead of time because I learned that from someone here at AAPS. They said, talk to your employees. Tell them that you will stand by them. And I had to dip into it a little bit. But I, I'm out of it, and I'm happy to say on Monday I bought them all a nice dinner and gave them all a check, a bonus. So thank you, APS. Thank you, staff. If you want to reach me, here it is.